Hey, Newscast listeners, just want to give you a little information about the mission of the Newscast. Our mission stems from the mission of the Red Smith Banquet, and that mission was to support youth sports in the Fox Valley. Over the 57 years of its existence, we've been honored to give out over a million dollars to various youth sports organizations throughout the Fox Valley. The NoosaCast is looking to continue that mission and support youth sports as well. You can help us do that by donating to the NoosaCast and the Red Smith Sports Banquet. On today's NoosaCast, we're talking wrestling, Kimberly Wrestling, with their head coach, Jordan Weinzettel. Tasha and I take an old look at new, which is brought to you by Raleigh Winter and Associates. Our Red Smith Banquet Throwback takes us to 2008. 2008 Red Smith Banquet. We brought in a Packer defense alignment. You'll remember him, Aaron Campman. Tasha and I finish off like we always do with a little It's Forgotten and I'm Never Forgetting. So pour yourself a cup of coffee and let's get this show on the road. football players, basketball players, soccer players, cross players. I'm, I'm around them all the time in the summertime, and I'm just trying to build a connection with them and get to know them and, and just try to encourage them to come out for the sport of wrestling. And I tell them, hey, you know, even if you're not 100% sold on it, come to an open mat and try for one practice. Welcome to the NoosaCast. What is a NoosaCast? It's where we bring local folk stories to life through conversation. All right, Newscast listeners, welcome to another episode of the Newscast. We really appreciate everybody coming on and listening. Uh, keep, please tell your friends, tell your neighbors. Uh, tell people on the street you meet, tell everybody uh, what a great podcast this is. And, you know, we have another great episode. Uh, we're going to be talking with Jordan Weinzettel, who is the uh, wrestling coach at Kimberly. And uh, he's he's young. He's been his second year. He has uh, some huge ambition. He is just super excited about the sport of wrestling. And you're going to be able to tell that through the interview as well. Tash, I love it when we have these young coaches on. Uh, they, they, right. They're full of passion. They're, they're young in their career. You had a great interview with, with Jordan. I, I'm sorry I missed it, but I'm really looking forward to actually hearing the interview. Um, I've, I've already heard it, but it's it's fantastic, Tosh. Yeah, Jordan. Jordan's a. a guy. I've known Jordan for a while. Uh, he's actually marrying uh, one of our neighbor's daughters. Uh, he's married to one of our neighbor's daughters, and they're having a child in July. So, hey, nice. Um, I've known him since he was in high school. He's a you know great young man. Uh, great family uh yeah i i was a it was a lot of fun to talk to him about wrestling uh because i've talked to him here and there but it was good to sit down and actually have a conversation about it and his views and him growing up wrestling so yeah you're going to enjoy the interview for sure and another cool thing is uh jordan actually trains with keegan keegan grenrich oh nice and uh keegan is going to be fighting june 7th at the uh horseshoe casino in indiana he's defending his title so that is super super exciting um if you are interested in that uh you can obviously go to the, the horseshoe casino in hammond indiana or you can catch it on the ufc fight pass um, so that is the lfa lightweight championship that he is defending uh eight o'clock Central Time on June 7th, Friday. And that's awesome. And, and Keegan has a great presence on social. Follow him. He shows his workouts. Guy's just a warrior. Yeah. He's uh he it's fun yeah. to watch. I get sucked into those sometimes, Tosh. Yeah, I hope he, you know, obviously we hope he does really well. Uh Jordan said that um on three days after the fight, he is scheduled to uh help with Kimberly's wrestling camp. Oh, so nice. <laughs> um yeah. So that that should yeah, he said that that'll be interesting to see what happens there. So yeah, we wish the best for Keegan, and we're going to be following him. Uh, I know I want to check that out. So um, the best of luck to Keegan. Uh, you know, take home another championship. Heck yeah, heck yeah. We'll have to get him back on the Noosa Cast and, and get an update from him. Absolutely. What else we got going on, Joe? Well, Tosh, I mean we're we're in summer, right? It's June. It's it's Absolutely. it's music time. We um. 
you know, we, we, we've had downtown incorporated Jennifer and, and her whole crew and they, they're the ones that do the Thursday music, the Hyde music series, uh, concert series been in, you know, Houdini Plaza, it's down in Jones park, but it's, it's, yep. it's great. And that, you know, they've released their schedule, but you know, the day the podcast comes out June 6th, star 69 is, is, is playing in Jones park. And, and I'm sure that's going to be epic. One of my favorite bands next week, June 13th, copper box. Uh, I love them. There's a, oh, yeah. there's an accordion in that band. They're, they're fire, man. But, uh, the concert looks great. It's every single Thursday, except, except the 4th of July, every single Thursday. And it's, it's, you know, when we get to mile of music time, they've got, um, you know, a, a mile act. That, that's all. That's a huge stage, obviously for, for mile. Yeah. Uh, I know the glam band is huge. They, they play August 8th. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot, you know, ask your mother, the, the road trip, the dweebs, you know, playing with fire and jump. I mean, let's go. These are smoke road, Tash. These, these are incredible <laughs> bands. So that's Thursday. And then you take it to Wednesday and Milo music, you know, Milo music present. When we talked to Dave Willems in a, in an earlier episode, he kind of laid out what Milo music does and that branching off and, you know, they, they need to make money. I mean, my, my need to be self-supporting and they team up with the Radisson, uh, or no, I'm sorry, the Hilton paper Valley hotel, old habits break hard there, Tosh, uh, in a courtyard every single Wednesday night, five 30 to seven 30 terrific setting. I love going there, but mm-hmm. they have an awesome concert series there as, as, as well. Yeah. And, uh, I don't have the lineup in front of me, but you just know with Milo Music putting talent on that stage, it, it's going to be good. So Wednesday Absolutely. night, you've got it covered, you know, uh, outside. Uh, I, I believe on Wednesdays they go inside if it rains and you've mm-hmm. got Thursday night music. And then that's just the big events, Tash. I mean, you go to, you know, I've talked about it. You and I have gone to shows at Poplar Hall. And, and you know that I've seen shows here recently, the Commodore Club, and and you know the the, the yep. so many so many venues. Every bar restaurant has music, so it's this is it for this is take it in, bring it in. It's 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 yeah. there. And you know what? It's really cool. Uh, the courtyard. You have the whole hotel around you. It's a it's a cool setting. Yeah. But is there anything better than sitting down in Jones Park at night with? All you know, it feels like you're in a much bigger city yeah, than Appleton. It does. It's just a really cool spot in the ravine. So yeah, check out some music there. Check out some events. Uh, it's fantastic. You know, it's nothing like the city of Appleton during the summer. You know, Tosh, you bring up a really good. You know, you and I shout out hidden gems all the time, and and I don't know if Jones Park is considered a hidden gem, but that stage and pavilion that uh, is it Myron mm-hmm. Construction, I think one of the construction companies. I should know this. I'm, I'm sorry that I don't know, but. Somebody gifted that to Appleton, one of the construction companies, and that is, I mean, that's a big time stage that that's that it is can hold anybody. Yeah, and to have that on a Thursday night, you're right with a couple thousand people there with the, you know, the the county buildings up up there in the hotel and the in the convention center, and it's it's even the bridge or the setting is just, it's so good. It's such a beautiful place, and the sound is good. And you're right, Tash. That that is a fantastic place to be on a thursday night yo absolutely it is it's one of my favorite spots um i love checking out the music there they're in mile of music it's just it's fantastic so you know if you have time check it out and listen to some good music and uh enjoy yourselves you know get outside like we've been talking about the last couple of weeks get outside it's outside and enjoy the world around you uh, it's always better than being inside your basement with the Windows closed, playing video games. Tosh, you reminded me of a story. You're absolutely right in in the courtyard. That is a terrific setting. I love it. I remember I, whenever Kendall Street came to Mile, and, and remember when Dave Willems said that he he was shocked by that pick as my favorite band to, to come there? Uh, yeah. I remember seeing a set that they played there, and it was they were so good. But I remember looking up at the hotel, because all the artists stay in, in the hotel. So... Mm-hmm. A few of the windows, they're looking on, listening to Kendall, you know, up on the third floor, just just swaying and dancing away, listening to Kendall Street. And it was, <laughs> there must have been a half a dozen of them in various windows just getting down with the groove. And it was it's just a really, really cool setting. It is. It is. Absolutely. And speaking of cool settings, um, I believe and Joe, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I believe this week we uh, start the Saturday farmers market. as yeah. well. Yeah. Right? Oh, absolutely. Right. Our friend jennifer and her vibe setting team this is what they do they do the farmer's market and it's as good as you'll find anywhere it's 
They they just did remember the night night light the night um, was mm-hmm. great, but the farmers market oh so good Tash again is there anything better than a nice sunny Saturday morning with a cup of coffee just strolling the avenue listening to the street musicians trying some of the food absolutely loading up for what hoped to be what a, a nice dinner Saturday night maybe Sunday yeah. oh I love that absolutely yeah it's fantastic it's a, it's an awesome experience and uh, you know. I like to get down there a little early to avoid some of the rush yeah. and uh, get the good pickings. But um, yeah, definitely check out the farmer's market as well. Remember the challenge of trying to get a stroller or a wagon through there? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Don't have to worry about that anymore. I just have to worry about not running into That's them. That's exactly right. Which is usually on me because I'm not paying attention. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> you and me both. You and me both. I, I tend to look up. Not, not. Yeah. I miss those, Tash. <laughs> I miss those. Absolutely. Well, Tash, geez, that's, I'm, we're busy here. What else? Do you have anything else to cover? Yeah, not really. You know, there's a lot of things coming up. So, uh, you know, check out the world around you and enjoy. Absolutely. We say that all the time. So, Tash, we'll get on to Jordan's interview. But first, uh, we're going to hop on into an old look at new. It's that time again, once again, for an old look at new. Brought to you by Raleigh Winter & Associates, celebrating 55 years. Did you know that in 1962, an Appleton Junior High School teacher with a strong work ethic started a residential realty company? His name, Raleigh Winter. Three generations later, the Winters still hold true to a strong work ethic and an excellent reputation in the community. Today, Raleigh Winter & Associates remain actively involved in providing retail, office, and industrial users an affordable, well-designed working environment through the creation and or acquisition of quality real estate in the Fox Cities and even beyond new. So what do you say? Let's take an old look at new. All right, Newscast listeners, it is time for the old look at new. We take that look at history and uh, see how far we can go back this week. Joe, what do you got for an old look at new this week? Well, Tash, I, I talked about it a lot last fall. I discovered I discovered disc golf. And, and I thought, you know what? It's, it's that time of year right now that the courses are all open. And I want to tell everybody just how we are. We, we've got a lot of great disc golf courses that and they're free a lot of them are free a couple of them you have to pay but right in the city of appleton tash i mean if you just want to okay. go and play disc golf tallulah park pierce park both yeah. have you know nine holes uh pierce might have 12 but um it's it's beautiful i mean it, those are great parks both kind of along the river the train tracks run there free just Toss the disc. If you want a little more wide open, go up to Plumman Park. That's free. That's huge. Wide open. You, you meander through the, literally the whole park. And okay. right, right in your neighborhood. You can bike to these places. And then you want to go a little bit further. You know, oh, how is there in, in, in Nina? West side of Nina, on, on I think it's Irish Road. That's a fantastic cut through the woods. Just a beautiful um disc golf course you do have to i think it's like three dollars to pay it but it's well worth it it's it's well maintained and you know we, you and i had talked about in some of our old look at news um grignan uh both both what what he did when when he he came and, and kind of settled that that area well there's a disc uh-huh. golf course that, that's right there as well and that's a fantastic one uh cut okay. through cut through those right by the river you, you, you're basically up and down it's it's tough and i love the sport and i just i wanted to highlight that for gosh sakes, get out there and play disc golf. I, I love real golf, and I'm always amazed by just kind of how a, a lot of the same philosophies apply for both sports. You think about shots the same way. You, you know, just a, a, a lot of this. There's a very there's a lot of similarities, and and I love the sport. And you and I talked about you know some of the. Oh, the the, the last uh, episode we, we talked about, just get out and take a look at the stars. And you said something mm-hmm. to the effect of, well, just get outside and walk around. Well, well, here's your chance. Walk around with a Frisbee. Absolutely. And, and we're all near there. So, yeah, I know, there's some, I know there's some courses if you just want to travel a little bit outside of Fox Valley, too. A lot of good ones. So oh, I went there. Absolutely. are, And I tell you what. In the Stevens Point area, Portage County has some fantastic, absolutely is is beautiful. Some of the nicest golf courses I've ever been on. Um, 
I'm blanking on their names, but uh, they're, 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 they're state parks um, or, or state run or county run, I should say, county okay. run um, disc golf course. It's similar to what Plum and Park is, and they're they're beautiful. Standing Rock, it came to me, Tosh. It takes me a minute, but I got a okay. Standing Rock <laughs> and something like Yuma Hills or something along those lines, both just beautiful, tough disc golf courses. But you're right. I mean, they're literally, they're all over the state. They're all over America, really. I mean, if mm-hmm. you're out road tripping, I mean, summer's road tripping time, right? Throw your right. discs, you know, throw your discs in the trunk. That's a great place. To, if you're sitting in the car all day, shoot, get out and walk around for an hour, man. Nothing better. Chuck a disc. There you go. Bang in chains, as they say on part of my take. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Tash. Well, that's my old look at new. How about you? What are you taking a look at in our area? Well, I'm going to go back to 1883. Um, in fact, June 5th, 1883. And a gentleman by the name of William Horlick uh, patented the first powdered milk in the world. Oh. And it was intended as a health food for infants, and it was called malted milk. Yeah. So it is now a staple in, you know, fountain drinks and survival provisions. But, you know, we've had a little talk about, you know, the great malted milkshakes uh, yeah. at like Leon's and Arden Eddie's and, you know, places here in the Fox Valley. Um, so... You know, 1883 was when malted milk first became patented. Okay, Tosh, can we agree? I think we're on the same page. A malt is better than a shake, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so this guy literally, this that was the start of the malt. Because, I mean, I remember my dad, and they don't do this. Maybe they do this at Leon's or something. But when you get the malt with that, just that malt that hits you in the back of the throat. Oh, I love that feeling. Yeah. But where they get they, the chunks. Yeah, the chunks of malt still in it. Yeah, and, and they mix it in those steel cups, you know, behind yep. the counter. You know what I mean? And then if you yeah. if you really get the authentic one, you get the steel cup with the glass that you pour the steel, you know, the steel cup into the glass, right. and just oh my god, come on now, Tosh, I'm starving now for a malt. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, the, it should be. It's that time, that season. <laughs> yeah, the authentic ones are hard to find. I mean, I, I you know Culver's has a has a good malt, but it, it's not. Yep. They just don't do the classic malts very, very much. Um, and when you find yeah, them, yeah. man, you get to the gold. There is. Oh, gosh. And now you, you've you got me. There's a great place in Hortonville. I think it's Jim's Drive-In. Yeah. Is that yes. it? I, I don't know the name of it, but you're absolutely right. There, there yeah. is a drive. Yes, that that's one that has a great time. That malt's got to hit you in the back of the throat. That That's absolutely. that's the key. That's the yeah, key. Yeah, you have to find that good old-fashioned drive, drive-in. That's been around for a long time, and they'll treat your rights. I just had an idea pop in my head. You know how Portnoy rates pizza all the time? Yeah. What if you and I went around? And your your son, right? Ethan did this, I think, right? Ethan did this, yeah. yeah. Ethan did. We yeah, need the one to in do that. One in Hortonville was on the top of his list. And I, yeah. I, I want to say that it's that it's Jim's drive-in um, in Hortonville. And uh, maybe somebody who can who's listening can correct me on that if I'm wrong. But fantastic place in the valley. I mean, obviously, like Oshkosh, you got Art and Eddie's and you got uh, Leon's. Um, they're they're great places as well. So, all right, Tash, we 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 just had a NoosaCast meeting live in front of everybody. <laughs> we have to get Ethan with a camera, and we will do. We will talk him into doing that with Lindsay's help, and we will create that into content. And Ethan will <laughs> will retrace his ranking of malts in in wow. northeastern Wisconsin this summer. We'll we'll see if he agrees to that. He's a 15 year old boy now, not a 12 year old. <laughs> so well, if, we'll if, see. He, if he doesn't <laughs> if do he it, agrees. I'm gonna. If he doesn't do it, I'm gonna do it, or we'll tag team it or something. Right. But we have to because again, Tash, it's about hitting in the back of the throat. That malt taste is absolutely, just epic, absolutely epic. <laughs> Tash, I, I need to go have a malt, and I don't know. We'll, we'll go see if Dub at Raleigh Winter wants to wants to go have a malt with us. There you go. <laughs> Hey, Newscast listeners, welcome to another uh, interview. And this week, we are very excited. Uh, I get the pleasure of interviewing Jordan Weinzittel. Weinzittel. Uh, he is the new uh, he's, he's the wrestling coach at Kimberly. And I've actually uh, known Jordan for quite a while. Uh, he is married to one of our neighbor's daughters. And uh, so I've had the pleasure of knowing Jordan since high school. So this is a treat for me. I'm super excited. And uh, welcome to the podcast, Jordan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. 
Yeah, you know, I I thought this would be a great opportunity. Um, we've had uh, Dan Sharon Brock on, who was a wrestling coach, and he wrestled in high school and at UW Eau Claire. Um, he's a couple more years. His son wrestled as well, and we had Keegan Greenrich on as well, and he has a big match coming up in uh, June seventh. So I want to continue this role of uh, wrestling because I, it's it's a it's an amazing sport. It really truly is. Yeah. Yeah. So what I, I guess growing up, when did you start wrestling? What age did you get into it? Um, my earliest memories of wrestling is um, my parents loaded me and my uh, brother up in the minivan when I was in kindergarten and told me that we were going to go to wrestling practice. And um, I don't remember asking to go or anything like that, <laughs> but I think it was just something that my parents signed me up for. And yeah, I started in kindergarten, so it's been it's wow. been quite the journey since then. Were you was it something that you just like fell in love with right away or was it something that you're like, oh, "All right, this took a little bit of time, but I I love it now." Um, I think that um I'm a very competitive person. I think that's always started from a young age, and I don't remember a particular time where I I really tr- like realized I was falling in love with the sport, but um, yeah, I guess like I started at such, such a young age and I, I remember going to a tournament with my older brother at the time. And, um, this is one of my first tournaments ever. And I ended up taking third and my brother took fourth and, and I didn't really care about the fact that I took third. I was just happy that I had beaten my older brother in a sense. I, we were in the same bracket, but he took fourth place in his and I took third <laughs> in mine. So I think just that competitive nature um, just kind of drove me towards it. And then I stuck with it for such a long time that inevitably I, I fell in love with it. That's amazing. I, I remember taking my own kids to learn to skate and them coming off the ice crying and being like, oh, I don't want to do this. Did, did you ever have a moment like that where you're like, huh, at maybe at a young age, you're like, yeah, I'm not so sure this is for me. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think every kid probably has that at some point, <laughs> I remember my mom having to force me to get into the van to go to tournaments because for whatever reason, I woke up that day and just didn't want to do it. Um, but, you know, as soon as I was in the van and as soon as I was at the tournament, I was happy to be there and always had such a great time. But for a while there, it was a force for my mom to to get me to practice. <laughs> That's I think all parents do that at some point, don't they? And you're going to find you're going to find out about that in a little bit. Uh, well, we'll just you know, Jordan and his wife, Carrie, are going to have a little child in a uh, gosh, not too long. Um, Coming up in July. Yeah, in July. And, you know, maybe uh, maybe the wrestling gene will be passed on. Right. Yeah, hopefully. You know, we'll <laughs> see. We'll see. So um, you're wrestling and I, you know, at a young age, what were your opportunities to wrestle? Were there? a lot of clubs around um, because this was, you know, how many years ago? Uh, man, I'm 25 now and you're yeah. five or six years old in, in kindergarten. So uh, coming up on 20 years of experience yeah. in wrestling, if, if you start to do the math, which is crazy to even just think about that. So what club did you start with or was it like more of a wreck opportunity or what yeah, was going it, on then? It was through the Kimberly wrestling Okay. youth program that I got involved in. And I did that for a number of years. Um, and then somewhere along the line in about probably I'd say like third or fourth grade, I got with um, some of the Lee brothers, Robert Lee, Zach Lee, Rob Lee was our, our coach. Um, but they were stud wrestlers at the time they were living in Manasha and they, they said, Hey, you know, we're looking to get a group of wrestlers together. And um, for whatever reason, they saw some potential in me and, I remember going over to their house in Manasha and in the basement, there was just some mats rolled out. And that was kind of the start of my um, wrestling outside of just your typical, outside of your typical like youth program. So yeah, started in in the Kimberly wrestling program and then gained a a lot of experience through Fox Valley elite ended up becoming of this. It it all started in the basement in Manasha and then it grew and grew and, and Rob had a vision for what he wanted his program to be and brought in a lot of amazing wrestlers from the area. Um, Eric Barnett was a three-time state champion, but then wrestled for the Badgers. Keegan O'Toole is now a two-time national champion wrestling at Missouri. Um, 
just a ton of high level wrestlers, um, just in Wisconsin that all started going to this club and, and that, that gave me so much experience and, and I learned so much. And I, that's probably when I was starting to realize like, Hey, I love this, man. This is so much fun. And yeah, I really got to credit a lot to them for what they've done for my, my future success and success throughout my career. Now they, that program is still going, right? Yeah. Now, so yeah. Rob Lee, Rob Lee senior um, was my coach when I was going through it. And now Robert Lee, his son um, has, has taken over. Okay. That's incredible that it's been going on that long and has become that strong of a program. That's, that's really cool. Uh, so, you know, you, you, uh, did you play any other sports during this time as you were growing up or was wrestling like the one thing for you? Wrestling has always been my mainstay. Um, in about fifth grade, a lot of my friends were into football and just being in Kimberly naturally, you know, you're around football all the time and, (laughs) and at, at, uh, at recess and stuff, football, you got football games going on. And like I said, I'm a competitive person. So you put me in something. So I started to get involved with football in about fifth grade. Um, and then did that from fifth grade all the way to, uh, till after my freshman year. Okay. Um, but then after my freshman year, you know, I was 106 pounds as a freshman, <laughs> you know, tr- trying to survive on this football field. And I was blessed with having a lot of wrestling knowledge, but being 106 pounds going against some of these kids that are over 200 pounds. Um, <laughs> I, I really didn't think that football was, was going to be for me at the time. Um, okay. so then I got into cross country after I got, uh, uh, after I stopped playing football and that, uh, that was just to really stay in shape for wrestling, but I, I did, you know, enjoy cross country as well. Do you, do you think that was, I mean, obviously that's a big help on the mat cardiovascularly. Uh, was that something that, I mean, like you said, it was something to stay in shape, but something that you started to enjoy. Um, and how did that help you in the, in the bigger sense for being on the wrestling mat? Um, well, obviously cardiovascular endurance is a huge, a huge part of the sport. Um, and, and I knew that cross country was going to help me be better prepared when the season started, I would just be ahead of the game as far as cardio. Um, but any wrestler will tell you that you can run as much as you want, but there's nothing like wrestling cardio. So you got another person's hands on you and you're not only carrying just your weight, but you're carrying the weight of another person who wants to oppose their will against you. You know, that's a, it's a completely different cardio. So cross country really helped me um, get prepared in a sense and to get ahead of the game, but okay. there's still a lot of work to do. Did you have any of the other wrestlers doing cross country with you as well? Or is that something that you just kind of took on yourself? There was a couple upperclassmen who weren't football players and they were also doing cross country. So, okay. um, yeah, after my freshman year, you know, just being around the wrestlers there, they're like, Hey, come out for cross country. And I'm like, you know, my coach knew I wasn't playing football anymore and knew that I would only help me and yeah, give it a try. So I know you're not 106 pounds anymore. So when, <laughs> when did you hit your growth spurt? And, uh, I mean, yeah. When did you hit your growth spurt? <laughs> well, um, so my freshman year I was 106 pounds. My sophomore year I was 113 pounds. And then um, from my sophomore year to my junior year, I hit a little bit of a, a growth spurt and was up to 132. Um, and then my senior year, I finished at 145. Um, okay. But then in college, my first year of college, I was at 165. So <laughs> I, I hit a, a small spurt in high school, but then I hit another bigger spurt heading into my college college career. So... Um... Well, I guess we'll kind of transition into your high school career. Um, what, what, I guess, I guess my question is, what is the thing about wrestling that is, is all in for you? And what do you try to tell your, your, uh, your wrestlers, you know, try to give them what you got out of it? Man, that's a, I feel like that's a loaded question. I, I think there's a <laughs> lot, there's a lot that goes into, you know, just the sport of wrestling in general, but I, I tell, you know, we have a meeting with our, our youth club and not to start talking about coaching right now, but I, I tell everybody that you need to find a way to love the sport. Oh, and, and a lot of things that go into that too, you know, I was, I've always been a competitive person. So that kind of drew me towards it, but 
you got to fall in love with the process of going to practice and getting better each day and pushing yourself to the limit. And you got to fall in love with stepping out on the mat and competing against another person. And, and in the early stage of it, it's just finding ways to have fun with it. Okay. You know, it's, you don't have to take it so seriously all the time. Some people are like, you know, nose to the grindstone and we got to do this. We got to do this. We got to do this. But if you're not having fun, then it's only going to last so long. Once yeah. you finally find to lo- love the sport and it's not a chore to, to go through all that, that tough, grueling workouts that you go through, once you love doing that, then you're going to start to get better. Cause now you're not, now I'm not that kid that my mom has to force get in the van. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, Hey mom, it's time to go to practice. Let's go. You know? Yeah. Um, so once I think once you, you find that, that's when you're really going to start to see more outcome. Okay. You have to really believe in yourself. You have to have a lot of confidence because you're out there on an Island and everybody's watching you. And how, how did that develop for you uh, from growing up all the way through high school, even into college? What was the, the, the thing that, you know, you look to, to, to get yourself to that point where, all right, I can do this. Um, I, I think that, you know, my mentality towards my confidence has kind of shift throughout my career. I think the more, you know, obviously the more you're in those different competitive settings, um, gain more confidence and learn a little bit from it each time. Um, in high school, I really think it was just my, uh, my drive for competition and, and never wanting to lose and always wanting to win that just, you know, you see some kids go out there and they're defeated before, before they step out on the mat. Um, but for me, it was refusing to admit that this person is a better wrestler than me. And it, it just, you know, helped me have, have success, I guess, with, with just being competitive. Um, but then in college, you know, my mind kind of shifted and it was, it was more like, it doesn't really matter what the outcome of this is. It's, I'm going to put in my best hundred percent effort and that's all you can do. You know, I had confidence in everything that I did leading yeah. up to that point. You know, I, I, when I was in practice, I was, I was giving it a hundred percent every time, you know, I was taking care of my recovery, taking care of my nutrition, taking care of, you know, my rehab and everything I did. I checked all those boxes. So that way, when I stepped out on the mat, it's the only thing left to do is give my hundred percent, you know, and if, if yeah. the outcome I lost was all right, then this person's a better man, you know, but if I, yeah. if I won it, so I knew I earned that through all that hard work. So I think your confidence comes from your preparation. Okay. You, when you, we look at college, you know, we know that only 7% of all high school athletes even go off to any level of college and play it play a, a college sport. Um, that's got to be a, a big jump moving from high school to college wrestling. How, how was that? Was that just like an incredible <laughs> kick in the pants kind of? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I think everybody, everybody who plays on in a, in a college sport will tell you it's just a whole nother level. And um, for me, that was, that was motivating after my senior year. Um, once I realized that I was going to be competing in college sports, I was like, Hey, I know everyone talks about how much of a jump it is. So now I need to get to work. So I'm prepared for this. <laughs> After my senior year over that summer, I was, you know, training as hard as ever to try to prepare for that. But even once you're there, it's, it is that whole nother level. Um, especially for me, I, one of my main practice partners when I was a freshman was, um, Logan Hermson, who. Um, my senior year of high school, he won his first national title. And then, um, my freshman year in college is when he won his second. And I was practice partners with him on a daily basis. And, and I, you know, there was days I wouldn't score a point, you know, the whole practice. And, and so I, I definitely took my bumps and bruises and just tried to learn from it. So it is the jump. It is. That's definitely throwing you into the frying pan for sure. (laughs) Wow. Um, what did, you know, I guess to talk about that, what, what were some of the things that you learned from him? I mean, he, he's beating on you, but he's doing it to get you better and you're wrestling him to get better. So what are some things that you learned from him? Oh man, I don't know. I mean, a lot of aspects, it wasn't just technique that I was learning from him, but just, you know, the way he carried himself and in his confidence and, um, 
you know, we have very similar styles. We're tall, lanky guys who use leverage. Um, so, you know, if we talk about technique, low singles um, all day long and just learning how to scramble and move. And it was kind of, a, it, we kind of have an unorthodox style. So once we're, yeah. once we're moving and flowing together, it just feels natural. Um, and then people who compete against that, it's kind of awkward and, and it feels <laughs> uncomfortable for them. Thing. But yeah, and I just knew that every day when he when he's beating me up, when he's taking me down, when he's putting me on my back, I knew I was getting better, you know, yeah. so that was another thing that helped me have confidence is, you know, if I can defend takedowns or even take him down or get back points against a two time national champion, I know right. I can do it against whoever I'm about to step <laughs> on the mat against going back and looking you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to like, well, you know, I'll, I'll take it from any place. What is one of the big highlights for you? If you look back on wrestling and what's something that, uh, you know, you look back and say, yeah, this was, this was the, one of the amazing things that happened to me during my career. Oh man. Um, <laughs> that's another tricky question because I, I think that, you know, some people might think towards a specific accolade or achievement as far as like a tournament win or something, but for me, I think the the best, not particular singular moment, but just how much I grew as a person. Um, okay. you know, I think sports teach you so many life lessons and I, I know that I've matured so much and became so, a better person because of wrestling. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I've told people this before, but one of my greatest accomplishments in my opinion was getting the leadership award, um, my junior and senior year of college and okay. just knowing that I was a strong leader and, and help that was helping drive my team to be better. Um, was a really good accomplishment for me because it wasn't, it wasn't over, like it wasn't a selfish, you know, this, this is about me, but it was, this is about us and, and trying to help other people become the best versions of themselves. And I think that's, you know, part of the reasons why I got into coaching is because I just want to help other people find success and, and find the love for the sport that I have. It's, it's not surprising. Um, many of the people we've talked to, uh, whether it's Olympic athletes, um, whether it's, a uh, uh, Jack Tashner and pitching, a lot of them come back and say the same thing you did. It's not a particular event. It's being able to grow as a person, be able to pull my teammates together and just, you know, it's that camaraderie between all of the guys that really was the biggest thing that, that, that drew his love or her love to whatever sport they're playing. And I think, you know, you can see that. And obviously that's obviously something you want to continue with your coaching is to draw that same type of, of, of love for the game and helping your, your teammates and in, into that same position. Right. Absolutely. Hey, NoosaCast listeners, you can find every episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Please help us grow by subscribing or sharing the NoosaCast with friends or follow us on Facebook, X, TikTok, or Instagram. A huge thank you to Digstown for all the music in today's episode. Catch a gig or find them on Spotify. Northeastern Wisconsin Sports Advancement is a 501c3 organization. Our mission is to raise money, provide support, and bring greater awareness for youth sports organizations in Northeast Wisconsin. We do this primarily through the Red Smith Sports Award Banquet and the NoosaCast. Each year, we give back to the community through three initiatives, the Every Kid Plays Grant, the Gives Back Initiative, and scholarships to student athletes. Well, let's, let's uh, dive into your coaching career here. Um, okay. So wh- what what started your coaching after college or were you coaching in college as well and helping out? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> when, I, when I finished wrestling, so I, I was a starter all four years, so all of my eligibility was used up after my fourth year of college. Okay. And uh, – I'm a firm believer that four year college isn't a thing anymore. I think everybody, I think everybody <laughs> normally sticks around for at least five. Um, but I, I stuck around for my fifth year. I still had some schooling to finish up. 
Um, and so I was done wrestling, um, had just gotten knee surgery and was in the Stevens point area. So I, I still wanted to be, you know, around wrestling and a, a part of the team as much as I could be. So I was in the wrestling room and, and helping out, you know, coaching my former teammates and doing what I could there. So that, and that's kind of where the coaching started. But then after, um, I, I graduated college, I moved back home um and got a job in the area and then um my my former high school coach Ben England he you know asked me if I would be willing to go and coach with him and, and I just naturally was up there for open mats and and helping out yeah. with whatever I could um so yeah I just started coaching alongside him I I'm sorry I can't couldn't remember is this your first year as head coach or is this your second year now this is my first year this will be it all right so what does the program look like? What have you inherited and uh, what are some goals you have? Well, I'll take this time to just um, express some appreciation for coach England. Um, yeah. Not just, you know, he was an amazing coach for me and helped me take my career to the next level. And, you know, I, I had a lot of inspiration through him. He, he went to Stevens point. Um, and when I was coming out of college, I, or out of high school, I really didn't have a vision of, you know, what I wanted in life. And I knew I loved wrestling. And I saw that coach England was a successful wrestler at Stevens point. And I, you know, I wasn't even thinking about college really, but I'm like, sure, <laughs> you know, Stevens point, sign me up, let's go wrestle. And, and I think just being around him kind of steer me in that direction. And he's helped me grow a lot. And then, you know, coaching alongside him um, has been an awesome experience too. You know, I learned just as much about coaching wrestling from him as i did from the like, actual technique in wrestling okay um you know just seeing how he how he carries himself and how he handles certain situations and how he operates as a coach you know i learned a lot from him so it, it was it was a natural i think change of guard having yeah. you know him as a coach and then kind of passing it down to me um i think was was a good change from you know just the amount of experience and exposure I had from him. How long was coach England? Uh, was, how long was he head coach there? I think 10, 10 years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. He was, uh, he started his first year as head coach was my junior year. Okay. So okay. five, six, seven. Yeah. Around, around uh, 10 years. That's awesome. All right. So, so what do you have going on? I mean, what's your, you're kind of, you know, I know this is that time period where you have a little bit of contact with the kids and you're probably getting to that point where you want to, you just want to get in with them. What, what are some goals you have for yourself as a coach coming into this first season? Um, man, like, uh, I, there's a lot of goals I have just to think off the top of my head. Um, you know, just get, getting these kids to fall in love with the sport and trying to give them the experience that I had. Um, I, I'd love to, you know, just continue growing the program and get more kids involved with wrestling. Um, I, I think that I tell everybody we're on we're on the five year plan. We're going to take out Kakan <laughs> five years for the conference title. There you go. <laughs> um, some people might say otherwise, but that's my goal, and I think we can do it. Yeah, and just just get more kids involved and and grow the sport of wrestling. So, how do you envision getting more kids involved? Is that getting down to the middle school and elementary school, having you know your your uh, high school wrestlers get involved with that as well? Is that one of the ways that you can do that? Yeah, that's that's a good question, and that that was another goal that I was going to say is just you know, continue to learn more about what it takes to run a successful program. I think there's so okay. many aspects of being a coach and this is only my first year and I've learned so much already, but I know there's, there's still a lot more that I need to learn about how we can, how we can grow the program. And it, and it definitely goes down to the middle school and youth, getting those youth kids involved and loving the sport and enjoying going to practice from a young age. Well, you know, now they're going to do it naturally in middle school because they love yeah. it. And then by the time they get to high school, They've already been wrestling for a number of years compared yeah. to right right now. And I, I love the kids we have. And I'll, I'll take a, a brand new wrestler any day of the week. But right now our kids are coming in with, you know, zero to one to three years of wrestling. 
Right. Um, and, and that's what we're working with when, when we're in the high school team, Okay. you know, but if we can get kids who are, who have been wrestling six, seven, eight years, by the time they get to high school, we're going to be in a lot better shape, you know? So it is, it is growing the youth and growing the middle school and, and getting the high school kids involved and giving back to the program. It's all part of that. So do you, I, I know Kimberly, they seem to have a lot of uh, cooperation between coaches and, you know, getting kids in multiple sports. Um, do you have a lot of uh, cooperation that you, you have guys coming in and say, yeah, this guy, he's a good athlete. He's going to wrestle. Or um, is it been a little bit of a struggle to get these guys out on the team? Um, you know, there's always going to be some kids who are on the fence. Um, you know, I do the, as much as I can trying to talk with those kids. I, I help out with our strength and conditioning in the summertime. So I'm around you know, football players, basketball players, soccer players, um, lacrosse players. I'm, I'm around them all the time in the summertime. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to build a connection with them and get to know them and, and just try to encourage them to come out for the sport of wrestling. And you know, I tell them, Hey, you know, even if you're not a hundred percent sold on it, come to an open mat and try for one practice, you know, and if you don't like it and it's not for you, then, that's all right. But, you know, and I, I respect you for giving it a try, but there's, there's such a, a crossover between wrestling and other sports. And you look at footwork, you look at body control and all of those types of things. Um, it seems to be a naturally that as, as a kid, I, I'd be like, well, I play football, but yeah, wrestling is going to help me out a ton in the same game. And so is that one of the things you're telling even lacrosse guys, you know, th these guys are physical guys. Uh, they can, improve on that physicality by getting some more, some more, uh, awareness of their bodies as well in the wrestling rink. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, body control, like you said, body control, footwork, physicality, mental toughness is only going to help you in all those sports. And, you know, I think about football in particular, when you're on the line, that's wrestling, right? Like yeah. you're, you're getting in a stance and you're, you're wrestling and, and fighting for positions and learning how to manipulate another person um you know, against their will is is what football is all about and yeah, i i think that people know that that they can get better through the sport of wrestling but there's a couple things i know that some kids are worried about injuries and mm -hmm. and like you think about a, a football player in high school who has potential to go and compete on the college level and is, has scholarships or something lined up and they're not willing to risk an injury in wrestling um, yeah. you know, to potentially lose, lose out on that opportunity, which, which I understand. And you know, obviously in every sport, there's potential for injury. Um, but I also think that some kids aren't willing to go through the work and, and that's the, the truth. You know, some see a lot of great athletes who come out and give it a try and they're just not, not willing to put themselves through it. And it is, it is a commitment. I I've seen the wrestlers at Appleton East where I teach and um, I talked to Mr. to Dan Sharonbrock and seen his son uh, go through wrestling. It is a commitment. Great family, by the way. <laughs> they they had a lot of nice things to say about you in the past as well. So uh, he really respected you as a wrestler. He he yeah. When I when we when we've talked, he he mentioned you quite a bit. So um, that commitment is is just incredible. I mean, did you have to cut a lot of weight, or were you? <laughs> always that guy who, you know, you, you had the weight you were at and it was pretty easy for you to maintain it or was it a struggle at times? That's a good question. Um, again, in high school was a lot different than college. And that's part <laughs> of, that's part of growing and learning, um, in, in the sport of wrestling in high school. Um, I cut weight the wrong way. Like I remember my, my sophomore year when I was wrestling 113 pounds, you know, I, and I'm sure there's a lot of kids who still do this, but you know, I would get down to weight for my dual meeting tournament or whatever. And then as soon as the tournament was over, we had a tradition where we'd go to Buffalo wild wings and, <laughs> you know, you eat as much, as many wings as you can and you're drinking soda and you get home and you got handfuls of goldfish you're shoving in your <laughs> mouth and, you know, you come back the next week and you're, you know, 10 plus pounds overweight and you got to wow. weigh in on Thursday. You know, and it, it just, it was terrible for my body. It was, you know, terrible for my performance. Um, but that's, nobody had taught me any different, you know, that's just right. what I do. And that's something I hope to 
teach my kids through my coaching is the right way to get down to weight and how to take care of your nutrition and weight loss is really important. And it's, it's a part of the game and that's just the truth. Um, but then once I got to college, I, I like I said, I, I trained a lot in the summertime and I, I put on some weight and put on some muscle and I came into college, I was weighing like 160 pounds and I was so used to cutting weight in high school. And I, I told my coach at, at one of my first meetings before the season saying like, I want to wrestle at 149 pounds or whatever the weight <laughs> class was. And he looks at me, and he's like, you're tall, you're lengthy. I'd rather have you go eat and go lift. And I'd rather see you at 184 pounds. Wow. And, and I said, okay, you know, if that's what you want, you're my coach and I'm going to do that. So I, I just continued to lift, continued to eat and, it was the best thing that happened to my wrestling career because it was no longer when I was going to practice, it was no longer about how much weight could I lose in that amount of time. Right. It was more about once I was done cutting, like not cutting weight anymore. It was about how can I get the best at wrestling during this time? How okay. can I you know, improve the most? So it wasn't, I'm going to work so hard. I'm going to run fast. I'm going <laughs> to train at a high pace. It was okay. Let me, let me figure this out. Let me get this technique down and, like I said, it was the best thing that happened to my career because I was able to focus on getting better at wrestling. And then when I was, when I was performing, I wasn't drained. I had a, a stomach full of food and I was hydrated and you yeah. just performed better that way. Um, so, yeah. and that's, and that's something that I, I'm trying to get people to understand that yes, cutting weight is a part of the sport, but it's not, it's not that old school mentality anymore where it's get down to the lowest weight class possible because that's where you're going to be the best. I actually right. see it, you know, through my lens of that's not the case for everybody. You know, some people might benefit from going down one weight class if they're within that range. But okay. for the most part, I tell all my kids, especially new wrestlers, hey, go up and wait. Like, there's no reason for you to cut weight. You're a first year wrestler. You're not competing for a state title. You're not competing for a conference title. Is it right. worth? Is it worth starving yourself all week to maybe win one or two more JV matches? Like, come on. Yeah. You know? more important to 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 learn how to how to wrestle than to do that to your body and then you're not going to enjoy it too right are there some rules now in place I, I know it's gotten a little bit stricter at the high school level as far as the weight and the body mass and things like that yeah there is there is rules so we do um and there always has been rules but i think they've changed um throughout okay. the years and there's no i don't think there's any perfect system um, but the way it works right now is, you know, we do our, our hydration test and skin fold. So you step on the scale, um, they, they write down your weight, pass your hydration test um, by peeing in a cup. You know, they check that you're hydrated. And yep. then they, there's a few points, tricep, back, side, and maybe one other spot that they measure for, you know, the amount of body fat. And then they'll determine how much you're able to, what's your lowest weight class? I, I, I want to say that 7% body fat is the lowest you can be. It okay. might be five, five to 7% um, is the lowest you can be. So they'll calculate, you know, what, what's the lowest weight class you can get to. And then they have a weight descent program. You're only allowed to lose a certain percentage of your body weight per day. Okay. So if I, let's just say I can, I weighed in at 180 pounds on my skin fold in a week, it might say I could get down to, you know, 175 or 174 okay. or whatever, whatever they deem. And it's all, you know, you, you punch it into track wrestling and you can print out a spreadsheet that tells you how much you can go down by. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's quite a bit. <laughs> well, you know, they do their best they can to, you know, protect the athletes and, and yeah. there's still, there's still ways to, you know, bend the system and there's yeah. still wrong ways of cutting weight, but they do their best they can. So looking at high school, what are your numbers at right now? What are you, uh, you know, what are you looking forward to in this uh, upcoming season? Uh, you know, in the 2024, 25 season. Um, yeah, right now, I think we finished the year with 60 wrestlers. We are at about 50 boys and 10 girls. Nice. Um, and you know, I, we can talk a little bit about two, um, but just girls wrestling. I'm really excited yeah. with the direction of our girls program. And we, we have some great girls on our team and that the girls wrestling is just blowing up. Yeah. Um, um, but just to get back to your question, I'm really excited with the leaders we have. Um, 
just trying to build stronger leaders to help you know just grow the team and so we have some good upperclassmen who are doing all the right things you know being good citizens in the classroom taking care of their grades um helping out with anything and and putting in the work they're going to uh, out of season training and they're showing up to open mats and okay. they're encouraging their teammates to to, to be working too and um, that's just a good thing. I'm really so I'm really excited for those upperclassmen, but we also have a really great group of underclassmen and even more coming through the middle school who are really good, good wrestlers. And yeah, I'm just I'm excited to you know continue. So let's dive into that girl side. Um, you, I know there's a whole girl state tournament now, and it is yeah. blowing up. It's becoming incredible. I remember I was watching some of it on TV. And it was just some fantastic matches. So what's going on with the girls' side of things? Um, just worldwide girls' wrestling is blowing up. Um, when I was in college, we had, we, Stevens Point started the first uh, NCAA women's uh, college team. Wow. Um, so that was my, my first real exposure to women's wrestling. Up until that point, it was, you know, girls competing in, quote, unquote, men's wrestling, you know? Yeah. Um, yep. and there are still girls who do that, but now, you know, this is the first or second year where they're really starting to get to, you know, this year we had the first ever girls conference tournament. Um, right. we have girls sectionals, we have girls state, and it's just, it's just awesome to see. And, and you know, my perspective on girls wrestling has kind of changed too, um, over the past couple of years. And just, I'm a big advocate for it because I think the more eyes and more people you have involved in wrestling, the better. So, so are you, are you the coach of the girls team as well? I mean, do you, yeah, you, that falls, everything falls under you. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm the head wrestling coach and you know, they're, they're we don't really have a division of uh, men's and women's wrestling. Okay. Because like I said, this is, this is kind of the first year that second year that we've had girls only competitions before yeah. this if you were a girl and you wanted to compete in wrestling, you know, you, you might be wrestling boys, but there's enough girls now that girls can wrestle girls and, and there's still a shortage. We still need more girls involved in order to fill out our brackets and stuff. Yep. But, um, right now with the numbers we have, I'm, I'm the, the wrestling coach and who knows, maybe down the line, we have just as many girls as we do boys. And, you know, me that being would, the coach of both of them is impossible, but that would um, be amazing. <laughs> you know, I agree. I agree. Yeah. That's awesome. So, you know, I, um, is there something you want to talk about as far as a, as your high school program and maybe shout out some of your kids or, you know, get them, um, you know, they may hear this or you know, who knows, <laughs> we might send out some socials. So, <laughs> well, I should definitely shout out my coaching staff. You know, I'm, I'm the head coach, but it really does take a lot more than me. There's, I have an amazing coaching staff, Matt Ho, Ethan Kashek. Um, Zach Hasselberger was with us, Connor Zerpel, James Borgen, um, uh, Ben England still helping me out. And okay. Just all those guys and the coaches before me, Dan Laurent, um, all those guys just, I'm very grateful for what they've done for the program and what they're continuing to do. And, and none of it would be possible without them because, you know, I have a lot of experience with uh, wrestling myself, but, you know, this is, like I said, my second or my first year as head coach and there's so much I'm learning and there's just so much that those guys do do for me um and it just wouldn't be possible without them so definitely shout them out and, and show my appreciation for them so i have one final question i know this was something that took me a while after playing a sport and then go to coaching how do you separate the two what's the difference between wrestling as a as a competitor and now you're you're the coach and you have all of these guys you how do you control your emotions is it different um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, it is different because it's no longer about me. It's about these kids and, and uh, it's, it's been a cool change for me. Um, because I feel like I just focused on myself so much in college and just doing the, 
doing as much as I could to better myself. Um, but now, you know, it's, it's, it's about these kids and what can I do to help these kids become the best it can be. And yeah. I think that just my personality, um, is good as far as I, I'm able, I'm a pretty composed person for the most part. Um, there, <laughs> there has been times where I've, you know, jumped out, out of my seat and, and, and <laughs> had some differing opinions, um, with refs, but I'm a pretty composed person and okay. do as much as I can for these kids. What can I do to help them get better? You have to be a composed person when you are teaching elementary kids gym. <laughs> so you have to have a little bit of that, uh, that ability, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely some patience. <laughs> well, Jordan, uh, I don't, I want to thank you a lot for coming on, onto the podcast. Uh, this is going to be a great one. And I, you know, we can look forward to some amazing things coming from the Kimberly program with you and you at the head of it. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Um, it's the honor is actually mine. I, I love talking about wrestling and I love talking about coaching and my wife's probably thanking you because you know, if, if I'm not talking to you, I'm just talking to her about it. So, <laughs> well, yeah, anything we can do for you, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, Jordan. Thank you. All right, NoosaCast listeners, uh, we're in throwback. Aaron Campton is on and we are super excited this was from the uh 2008 uh red smith banquet and you know aaron has a great story he came from a small town only 270 people in his high school class went to the university of iowa and was drafted in the fifth round by the packers and spent a good portion of his 10-year career uh from 2002 to 2009 with the green bay packers and You know, if you know the Packers, you know Aaron. So what you're about to hear is only part of the speech by Aaron Campton. Uh, The entire full interview is on our YouTube channel. Just search NoosaCast or check out the link below in the show notes. Head over to YouTube to watch the entire speech of Aaron. Welcome to another throwback. Enjoy. Red Smith Sports Awards. Banquet Throwback. The Red Smith Award, of course, goes to someone who has made some unique contributions to sport in Wisconsin. And also epitomizes the great values that Red Smith exhibited. Let's give a Red Smith welcome. I am very pleased to present Aaron Campman the 2008 Red Smith Award. Thank you, Chuck. I'm glad I'm not in purple either. <laughs> we knew they were going to match it, you know, it's just part of the whole deal. Um, <laughs> I do remember that game, though, when, uh, when I broke my hand. It was the darndest thing. It was pregame warm-ups. I shot my hands in like, like, like anything regular, you know. And I thought, God, my hand is killing me. I went through the rest of the pregame warm-up, and uh, I took my glove off, and I tried to make a fist. I didn't have a knuckle. <laughs> and uh, I, I broke this bone right here. So I go up into the, uh, into the training room. We were totally depleted of the defensive line that game. I think it was my second year. Uh, no, first year, I don't know. You might know better. 2002 was my rookie year. Got hit in the head a lot of times, you know. I mean, come on. <laughs> I've had some concussions, too. Um, but anyway, we go in the locker room, and this was Mike Sherman when he was still here. And uh, Pepper Burris, our head trainer, says, uh, you broke your, your fourth metacarpal. I don't think you should play. And uh, Mike Sherman comes walking in, and, and he says, you going to play? And, I mean, he's looking at me with those big eyes, you know, and I, what am I going to say? I'm a rookie. Yeah, coach, put me in. <laughs> you know, so they cast it up with a big Q-tip. I had the big Q-tip on my arm, and, yeah, sure enough, went out there and played and got knocked out of the game. <laughs> Lord did not want me to play that day. But um, 
It was interesting too. You uh, you brought up that four six five. I want to tell you a story about this. This was interesting. Uh, I wasn't invited to the combine. I, you know, I, I was a uh, not a real high prospect coming out of the University of Iowa. I was a um, a good football player, but they didn't think I was going to be much. In fact, there were some teams that actually were scouting me as an offensive guard, which wasn't a real good boost to my confidence, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, anyway, I, 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 uh, since I didn't go to the combine, some of the teams wanted to uh, have you in for official visits, check you out, and stuff like that. So I go to the Green Bay Packers, where I really wanted to go, and I'm having a great visit. And I get to sit down with my position coach, Jethro Frank, Franklin. He was a defensive line coach. And first question he asked me, well, Aaron, you're here in Green Bay. Why do you think we should, you know, draft you? Why are you here? And, you know, I wanted to really impress him, right? So I give him this great answer. Well, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm a good person. You know, I work really hard. I've gotten good grades. I'm married. You know, you don't have to worry about me running the streets. Uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> All the, uh, the litany of things, and, and I keep going on and on. He says, stop, 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 stop. He said, the only reason you're sitting in that chair right now is because you're in a 4 6 five. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, great, welcome to the NFL. <laughs> you know, but um, I want to thank you guys for inviting me this evening. Uh, this is a great award. I have to be honest with you, I didn't know a whole lot about the Red Smith Banquet uh, until uh, Jeff Blum and Adam Willard, our, our PR people at the Green Bay, uh, told me about it. But over the last couple of weeks, I've been able to learn more about the banquet and now having experienced it this evening. Uh, this is quite a special, quite a special event. And so I want to thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to be uh, honored here and privileged uh, to be here this evening. My wife wanted to make it as well. Um, she wasn't able to be here this evening. She really wanted to. She sends her regards. We had a family uh, uh, health issue, so she wasn't able to make it, but uh, she sends her regards as well. Uh, I want to thank you again so much for, uh, for having me come down tonight. Um, please be cheering loud on Sunday. Uh, we are so excited. Yeah. Thank you. As a team, we are, we are so excited, so excited to be in this position. I told my wife the other day as we were driving home from the stadium, I said, you know, I just want to seize every moment. This is such a great opportunity. I came into the league, uh, we went to the playoffs three straight years. And, uh, and then we had two dry years, obviously, the last couple of years. And now to be back in this position, you know, you just want to seize the moment. Mike was saying uh, in the team meeting when we first started the playoffs, he said, uh, you know, his first year in the league, he was with Kansas City. And uh, they went to the AFC Championship, ended up losing. But he thought that's how it was every year. And he just kind of, again, told us, he said, guys, just you never know when this comes around again. So uh, I can guarantee you this, you'll, they're going to get our best shot. And uh, you'll, see a, you'll see a very, very good Green Bay Packers team on Sunday evening. So thank you very much. All right, Tash, another great throwback, and you can catch all our throwbacks, all 46, 47, whatever, whatever we have now on on our Newsicast YouTube page. So catch them live on Sunday mornings, but you can catch them anytime on, on the YouTube channel. And, and while you're there, please, 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 it helps us so much. Hit the subscribe button. Just That's all you have to do. Just hit the subscribe button. You don't even have to watch the videos. Just hit the subscribe button. <laughs> But we suggest you watch the right. videos because they're we, fantastic. We do. <laughs> Don't forget to watch them, but definitely hit that that bell or that subscribe. Or... All right, Tash. Well, that was a great a great episode, and I had, we're coming to an end. But we we always like to get a few things off our chest, and it's forgotten, and I'm never forgetting. So, how about you, Tash? What's what's forgotten in your world? Well, you know, I have to kind of say that I'm going to screw up our entire segment here. <laughs> because my forgotten and never forgetting kind of are the same. It's hard sometimes. It, both right. I, I can I can make arguments for both with some of these sometimes. Well, and it's the end of the school year. Yeah. So it's it's a uh, the forgotten piece is that you know school is a safe place for a lot of kids, and summer is very stressful because they don't have that consistency to come to school and that safe place that they feel. And so you know I I don't you know. I think we forget 
about that with kids and their mental health and all the issues that they have now, that school is a safe place. And a lot of the time we see behaviors ramp up at the end of the year, uh, right before a break, because students know that they're going back to something that may not be a safe place for them. And that school is that consistency for them. But on the other side, you know what? It's been a long school year and I don't know. Yeah, I'm ready for summer. <laughs> I'm ready for summer. Yeah, exactly. Um, I do summer school. So I still have the month of June where I run summer school at Appleton East through those kids who uh, might need a little bit extra. Sure. Um, but, you know, so the two of them are kind of are hand in hand. You know, we always say, oh, you know, school's out for the summer. Thanks, Alice Cooper. But <laughs> um, we, you have to forget, you have to remember that. Yeah, it's a time to get away, recharge, be with your friends, enjoy all that. But we also have to remember that side of those students who don't have that. And um, where school is a place that they come to because they feel safe um, and and things like that. So, you know, I want to tie that in. You know, school's out June 7th. It's the next. It's tomorrow. It's Friday. Uh, So, you know, congratulations to all the seniors who have graduated and um, to all those other students will. We'll see you in the fall. Tashi, you know, you had mentioned that about being a safe place earlier in one of the NUSA casts. And I always remember that because I never thought about that. But after you said that, it's opened my eyes to that. And you're, you're makes a lot of sense. And, and yeah, I that's something to really consider for, for sure. Yeah. That the safe place, you, that's that's huge. That's that's almost as most important out of all of this, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it is. Definitely is. So, all right, Joel, I guess I'm going to take you to your forgotten first, and then I'll take you to your never forgetting. <laughs> yeah. And we're forgetting what the segment's about. But, uh, <laughs> well, Tosh, I need to pick your brain. You know, last it was last couple of weeks ago, we, we talked about the etiquette of holding the door open and kind of told some stories about that. But I've, I've got another one for you. It's, you know, I've talked about my biking escapades and I got to pick your brain. So when it comes, and this applies to not only a biker, but a pedestrian, when you're going through the roundabout in the pedestrian walkway, aren't mm-hmm. the cars supposed to stop for you? <laughs> yes, no? they are. Okay. Even, yes, even, they are. If, even if they're in the roundabout, they're supposed to stop. Right. right? Yeah. It is, a, it is a state law okay. um, at all pedestrian crossings. Pedestrians have the right of way. Absolutely. A lot of people breaking the law, Tash. A lot of people oh, are breaking yeah. the law. Okay. Well, there's, you know what? I, the, the problem is that you might be one of those people who want to stop, but you see that guy riding your tail behind you who's not going to stop. And then they see the pedestrian sta- at least standing in a safe spot. So they just blow through it because somebody's going to run into you. But yeah, people need to realize that you have to stop at, at the roundabouts. I mean, I've seen four or five cars go through when I've actually stopped for somebody to go through. Oh, Tosh, it's it's unbelievable. I, see, you know, my, my most written route and and i i've i've complained about the the stoplight at, at calumet and john street the thing still doesn't change it aggravates me every freaking day but on that same ride right in front of crunch that roundabout that's right there yeah it's it's it, it's literally I, five out of the six times i go a week four out of the six times they do I, there's at least one if not six cars that i'm blatantly right that i'm crossing the street i could not be any more obvious i'm a pretty obvious looking person and <laughs> they some people are just completely oblivious they have no idea i'm even there others just choose not to stop but the, but then the, there are certainly a lot of good ones too that, that that definitely stop but i wanted to get your take i thought they were supposed and to you know stop what? at that time in the morning that roundabout is horrible yeah. Because I don't know what it is if people are trying to rush to McDonald's to get their coffee or what's going on, because you shouldn't be rushing that fast to get to work. <laughs> so yeah. um, uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe they need the McMuffin. I That that roundabout people, I've had people like tailgating me and everything. It's yeah. it's a bad roundabout. It, it certainly is. So, yeah, that's uh, I want that to be forgotten. Tash, come on now, people. Better etiquette. Let's hold the door for people. Let's stop for pedestrians. <laughs> right. So. Since I blew through the uh, never forgetting, what's your never forgetting then? <laughs> I don't know. So what am I doing, Tosh? I'm never forgetting something, right? Well, I tell you what, I'm right. never forgetting. I made this mis- well, it's not a mistake, but it's driving me nuts, Tosh. I made a strawberry rhubarb pie and it baked right before we uh, we started to hit record. And okay, oh, strawberry rhubarb pie is 
it might be my favorite tash i i think it's right. if it's not my favorite it's my second favorite good smelling fresh strawberry rhubarb pie hum baby <laughs> sounds good well i hope you did you enjoy it yet or have you not I, did. I took a look, took a quick little scoop before. Um, I, I have to be a little bit stealth because my dog is a food hound. So if I have food and I'm sitting <laughs> down here recording with you, you're going to hear Tasha's dogs I love because they have a great bark and a howl. My basset hound, you just hear clicking of claws on a wooden floor. So didn't think that'd make for good sounds. So in the interest of all the fine Newsacast listeners, my strawberry rhubarb pie is just in the kitchen in the next room. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, Tash, well, I think we better get the heck off out of here this week. But another great episode, and we'll have another great one next week. So, Tash, always a hoot and a pleasure. Thank you for listening to another great episode of the NoosaCast. We'd really appreciate it if you hit up our social pages, subscribe, like, follow, and don't be afraid to engage. Head over to our YouTube channel to get exclusive content like the full interviews and speeches from the past Red Smith banquets. Thanks for listening to the NoosaCast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and tell a friend. Help us grow by subscribing wherever you get your pods or sharing the news to cast. Follow us on Facebook, X, TikTok, or Instagram. One of the best ways to help us grow is to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. 